Oh, good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to our series for Advent. A child has been born for us, reading the infancy narratives. This is a series from the Jesuit Institute in South Africa. And I am David Neuhaus, a Jesuit from the Holy Land at the Institute for this year. This is the last in our series, as we all know, and we are waiting with anticipation. Next week, we will already be in the Feast of Christmas. So once again, I suggest that we begin with a beautiful Christmas song. Let's listen to it and be inspired to enter into our study session. We are once again in the fourth of our four-part series. I remind you that in the first uh, part of this series, we looked closely at the figure of Joseph presented in the Gospel of Matthew. In the second part, we looked at Mary as presented in the Gospel of Luke. 
And then in the third part last week, we looked at what Nazareth and Bethlehem signify in the story of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth born in Bethlehem. And now in this final part of our series, I'd like to look more closely at Jesus. And I've titled this last part, Jesus, Messiah and Son of God. Of course, we know that the word Messiah is the Hebrew for the Greek Christ. And I've divided this into two parts. I want to first look at certain aspects of the presentation of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. And again, that will take us back to the figure of Jesus and particularly his name. Jesus is his name. Needless to say, that's not necessarily solely in the Gospel of Matthew, but we have a very specific presentation in Matthew, and on that I want to focus. And first and foremost, the naming of the child Jesus. Remember, in that first of five sections focused on biblical citations, the end of chapter one, we have the apparition to Joseph. You see it in the illustration, Joseph's dream. And within that dream, he hears the words, you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So first of all, we are here to recognize that Joseph is given the role, the preeminent role of the father, naming Jesus. He will name Jesus. And thus, he is Jesus' father. And then, of course, the second aspect of this brief citation, it tells us what Jesus means. For Jesus is the Greek Jesus, which is the Greek translation for the Hebrew name, Yehoshua, or Yeshua. And that means he will save. And filling it out with its full theological significance, he will save his people from their sins. Again, in Hebrew, that would be Yoshia. And from there derives the Hebrew name Yehoshua, or in its second temple form, Yeshua. But I do want to point out something else, which is always important to remember, and I'm sure you know it. Just as Joseph was not the first Joseph we encountered, Joseph, son of Jacob, in the New Testament, echoes very strongly Joseph, son of Jacob, in the Old Testament. And then we also pointed out that Mary, Mariam in Greek, Miriam in Hebrew, is not the first Mary that we know. We encountered a Mary already in the story of the Exodus, and we made that parallel clear in our second part. Let us remember that Jesus is not the first Jesus we meet. So let us now look at one of the many texts that focuses on that very, very important Old Testament personality called Jesus. Jesus and Jesus, we read in the book of Numbers, chapter 27. Let's read it. Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint someone over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, so that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep without a shepherd. Let's situate this dramatic moment, the greatness of Moses. He has led the people for 40 years. They are now on the banks of the River Jordan on the eastern side. They can already look over the Jordan and see the land, the land of promise. They already see the city of Jericho. And Moses knows that he will not enter the land. This is a tragic part of Moses' life. After having led the people through all the winding ways of the wilderness, 
he will not go into the land with the people. But notice here his greatness. He does not say to the Lord, oh Lord, please change your decision. Let me go in with the people. Rather, he says, Lord, appoint someone who can go with the people. Someone who will go before them and who will lead them and bring them in. And then notice these words that should resonate if we know the gospel well. So that the people may not be like sheep without a shepherd. I remind you at this moment that in chapter 6 of the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus has said to the disciples, let us go to a wilderness place. Let us have a Sabbath moment. Let us have a moment of rest. They arrive at that place and the crowds have preceded them. And Joseph, sorry, and Jesus gets out of the boat and he sees the crowds and they are like sheep without a shepherd. It's a direct citation from here in Numbers 27, part of Moses' intercession, Lord, do not leave the sheep without a shepherd. Now let's continue to read in Numbers. So the Lord said to Moses, take Jesus, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand upon him. Yes, unfortunately, we don't always realize, it's not as apparent as it should be, that the name of this very significant person, let's hear his role, he is to lead the people across the Jordan. Yes, a moment of baptism, the word is used in the description of the crossing of the Jordan in chapter 3 of the book of Jesus. Oh, I'm speaking Greek. Let's speak Hebrew. In the book of Joshua, chapter 3, the crossing of the Jordan in a moment of baptism. And then he will chase out the demonic spirits from the land, making it a land for the word of God. Never we should, should we forget that the Jesus of the New Testament is prepared for by the Jesus of the Old Testament. And that Old Testament Jesus is described as a man in whom is the spirit. Moses will lay his hands upon him and consecrate him as a leader who will take over when Moses dies. So, yes, his name is Jesus. But we are not finished yet with the Gospel of Matthew. For there is another aspect in the Gospel of Matthew that is very, very interesting. In fact, only in Matthew, Jesus has another name. Let us read now a little further from that same citation. You are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then comes the citation, the first of those five citation texts. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Immanuel, which means God is with us. But one second, we thought his name was Jesus. Yes, Joseph names him Jesus, but he will be known also as Immanuel, God is with us. This is a very important feature in the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus, in fact, has two names, both of which signify his vocation. The first name, Jesus, Yeshua, he will save his people from their sins. And then a second name, Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This mystery this mysterious name will be fully understood by the time we reach the end of the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus, encountering his disciples on the high mountain, he will say to them, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This too 
is a name which signifies who Jesus is in our lives. He is with us always. And again, if we read it in Greek, God is with us. I am with you. We would see the similarity, the similarity in the use of language. Again, a beautiful opening of parenthesis in chapter one of Matthew and a closing of that parenthesis in chapter 28, the very last verse where the disciples are sent out to baptize all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, who is God, is with us. So that is a first part of what we want to do tonight. Now we want to move over to the Gospel of Luke. Mary, did you know that beautiful song that we heard sung by those beautiful children in India? That can be the refrain we should be singing as we read the only verse in the entire New Testament that describes the moment the very moment of Jesus's birth. And I want to spend the rest of our time looking at this incredible composition of Luke. Here it is, the moment of the birth, the birth of Jesus. We will hear this, of course, on Christmas Eve as part of a much larger text from chapter two, verses one to 14. Here, I just want to focus on verse seven and underline what an incredible composition this is. So let's read it slowly and gaze at the icon, the Byzantine style icon, that is such a wonderful representation of that moment. Many of the biblical elements we will have already noticed. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, this very complex composition, let's look at it more closely and notice. There are three actions of the she. The she, of course, being Mary. Remember, Miriam. Mary the prophetess, Mary, did you know, sing those children. And the verbs that describe the actions that she is carrying out in that moment of birth, let's look at them. She gave birth. She wrapped him. She laid him. Three verbs. Notice too, and it should strike us as a little strange, where she lays him in a manger. And then that strangeness is explained by the fact that there was no place for them in the, and the English translation says in, we'll look at that word more closely. Again, notice a complex construction, three verbs, and then no place, a negative explanation of the strangeness of the place where he is laid. The first thing I want to point out is that, again, we should remember the connection between Mary and Miriam. In their prophetic status, Miriam's actions were prophetic as she made the people dance. Mary's actions are prophetic. Let's look at them now in the light of a verse that comes towards the end of Jesus' story in chapter 22. I'm going to read the two verses one after the other so that you can try to seize the parallel rhythm. There is a parallel rhythm that is very, very revealing. So our first verse, the upper icon of the birth of Jesus, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger. 
because there was no place for them in the inn. Three verbs and then a negative explanation. Now, look at the second icon. We see there Mary too in that icon. Beautiful representation of the veneration of Jesus' body after he has been taken down from the cross. But let us read the Lupin description, and I hope it will be clear where I see the parallel rhythm. Then he, this time it's Joseph of Arimathea, took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. Look at the magnificence, the musical, rhythmic quality of this writing. Again, three verbs, the subject being a he, Joseph of Arimathea. And then the negative, where no one had ever been laid. Notice that the object of the verbs in both the first, the first verse and the second verse is the body, the body of Jesus. Her firstborn son, that too is a very strong Old Testament echo with the firstborn son that is being called out of Egypt. For indeed, when God meets Moses at Sinai in the burning bush, he says to Moses, Go and tell Pharaoh to let my son, my firstborn son, go. If not, I'll come and strike his son, his firstborn son. And again, the expression in the Greek of the Old Testament is exactly the same as the expression that Luke is using. But notice again, gave birth, took wrapped, wrapped, laid. In fact, I do want to point out that the Greek words are not exactly the same, but the rhythm of the threefold action of the she and the he, and then the negative. Is that not very, very interesting? And furthermore, notice laid him in a manger, laid him in a tomb. Let's look now at that manger. The manger is also known and I think would have echoed with those who are hearing this description of the birth of Jesus. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn, a manger. Let's be clear. Babies are not put in mangers. What is put in mangers is food for animals. Isn't that strange? What a strange place to put a baby. I know that many of us might have invented all kinds of cutesy explanations. It was cold, and so in the straw he would be warm. But notice in the iconic, in the iconic representation of the laying of the baby in the manger, there is always that ox and that donkey. Some of us might have been led to believe that St. Francis invented this. After all, we attribute the scene of the manger to St. Francis. But this is not St. Francis making it up. This is purely biblical. For look what we have at the beginning of the book of Isaiah. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Again, the pain of those Jewish writers of the gospel, recognizing the fact that most Jews have not believed in Jesus. And of course, that is a mystery. Paul calls that the mystery of Israel. Why? 
why do they not believe? That is not our subject for tonight. But please notice again that Luke has chosen a word that evokes an echo, an echo from the beginning of the book of Isaiah. Again, the mystery of the incredulity of the people of Israel faced with the birth of the King, the Messiah, the Son of God. But again, I want to go back to the strangeness of laying a baby in a manger. What on earth can that be all about? Now, Luke has explained why Mary laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And this is where we come to look more closely at that word inn. Is that a good translation for the Greek word? Or is there something else being pointed out in this verse? And so again, I want to jump ahead and look at what happens towards the end of Jesus's life, the night before he is crucified. Let's look at these two verses again, side by side. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And now I've put in, in inverted commas. I'm not satisfied with the translation in. I'm not sure what word we should use, but I've written it in Greek. And the word is kataluma, or in modern Greek, they'd say katalima. This is where there is no place for Jesus when he is born. Luke will use that word, the word katalima, only one more time in all that he wrote. Now, I am making an assumption that if he reserves the use of this word for two different parts of the Jesus story, he would like us to make a connection between these two parts. Remember, Luke wrote a quarter of the New Testament, 24 chapters in the Gospel, 28 chapters in the Acts of the Apostles, and this word is reserved for two particular places in the narrative. Let's look at the second place and notice again the problem of translation. Jesus has sent two of his disciples to go ahead of the rest to Jerusalem to prepare the place where they will celebrate the Passover. And he says to them, as they set off, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Do you see what I see? Do you see what the text reveals when we look at it in Greek? Where is the katalima? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. We remember the narrative, Jesus sends the two disciples and they will find someone who will lead them to the owner of this house, a man carrying a jug on his shoulder. And it's there that they will ask the owner, where is the guest room? Where is the katalima? The katalima is now prepared and ready. There was no place when Jesus was born, but now it is ready. And it is ready for what? It is ready for the celebration of the Passover. Now let's reflect on that. What does that mean, the celebration of the Passover? What will happen during the celebration of the Passover when Jesus, the night before he was crucified, will celebrate the Passover? with his disciples. And of course, we all remember that that is the day in which the Eucharist is instituted. For during that Passover meal, Jesus will take the unleavened bread and he will say, this is my body, eat. 
Unite yourselves with me in this profound mystical meal, this supper, so that you become what you eat. Mary, did you know? Again, look at what Mary has done, the prophetess. She has laid him in a manger. That's not some cutesy curiosity. It is a prophetic act. She has laid her baby in a place that is meant for food. And Jesus, the night before he is crucified, gives himself as food, as bread. I am the bread of life, John has Jesus say in the Gospel of John. But in our three synoptic books of the Gospel, it is on that night during the mystical meal of Passover that Jesus says, this is my body. Mary, did you know? Mary, prophetess. Mary, who lays her child in a manger. Remember again the greatness of this mother of God. Not only does she make place for Jesus in the very core of her being, carrying him at great risk, but she then offers him to the world. And here we see what Luke is suggesting. She is offering him to a hungry world that wants the bread of life. I'm going to take it one step further. Of course, the text, just this one verse, is so rich. We could do four, four sessions just on the one text. But I do want to point out, going back to the Old Testament, that this word, patalima, is a very interesting word. It doesn't appear a lot in the Old Testament, but there is one very, very significant text where we have this same Greek word, Again, some of you might be surprised, why am I talking all the time about the Greek Old Testament? Because that is the raw material the authors of the New Testament worked with. They were Greek-speaking Jews. And for them, the scriptures of Israel, for all of those Greek-speaking Jews, had been translated even centuries before they were writing the New Testament in order to understand the intimate link between the old and the new, we work first and foremost in Greek, of course, never forgetting that the first part of our scriptures, most of it was written in Hebrew. Let's read now this beautiful text from the second book of Samuel that uses that same expression, not just the word, but the whole expression in the Katalima. Ento catalumati. And here it is. Now, when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. Let's situate the text. We are in the seventh chapter of the second book of Samuel. The king is King David, the beloved of God the one who loves God and God loves him. God has given him rest from all his enemies. It's almost like a Sabbath. It's almost like the end of history. All his enemies have been put down and God gives him rest. But then we have a fall. The king said to the prophet Nathan, see now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Let's fill that out a little. So the king has built himself a magnificent palace. That's what kings do. And he looks out of the window and in shock, he sees the tent of meeting. Luke would not have called it the tent of meeting as we have it in our Hebrew. Ah, our translation from the Hebrew of the Pentateuch, Luke would see that the tent of witness, that tent of witness in which God resides. And David is shocked. I am living in this huge house and God is living in a tent. 
But let's notice there's something a little perverse going on. It's almost as if David is saying, I, a great king with a great palace, I want a God who lives in a palace, not a tent. Now, Nathan, who is the prophet, becomes a false prophet when he says to the king, go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. Now, why do I say Nathan is a false prophet when he answers the king like this? Just as David is trying to create a God in his image and likeness, David doesn't want a God that lives in a tent. David wants a God who lives in a palace. Nathan is confusing the king, David, with God. For he simply says, go and do whatever you have in mind. The Lord is with you. Almost the Lord is you. What does Nathan not do that a prophet should do? He does not take the word of David to God and say, God, what should I say to David? But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about, and the translation says, in a tent and a tabernacle. Yes, the translation says, but we see what Luke saw. I have been moving about in a kataluma. The kataluma is where God moves about among the people, where God is a manuel. God is with us in the tent, moving about. Notice there are many interesting aspects of this, but one of the most important is the fact that because God dwells in a tent, he is not nailed down in a palace. The king builds a palace so that all the people can come to him. But our God, our true king, moves about in a Catalina. By the way, I'll point out that in the Hebrew, the word moving about is exactly the same word that is used in that first description of intimacy after Adam and Eve have sinned. They do not die. God comes moving about in the garden. God is with them despite their sin, but they run away and hide in the tree. It's the same word. Again, we are focusing on that Catalina. The Catalina, which is the place where God resides. In the beginning, there was no place for Jesus in the Catalina, and so Mary laid him in a manger. But then the moment comes when Jesus will say, Eat, I am the bread of life, and that will be in the Catalina. And so, yes, we come to the end of this part, and I'd like to end once again with a beautiful Christmas carol. A Christmas carol that explains a little about what Christmas can be when we live in difficult times. Again, you know that I come from the Holy Land to have spent these wonderful months with you, but my heart is grieving, as I'm sure many of us are grieving, for what is happening in the Holy Land. The big question is, how can we celebrate Christmas at a time of such suffering? I'd like to now hear a hymn in Arabic. This time I've put the words on what we will see so that we can read along with the Arabic singing. I think it is a beautiful composition that shows us what Christmas can mean at this time as we welcome Jesus into a world in which there is still no place for him. The carol is called Leilat al-Milad, the night of Christmas. 
And there you have the refrain that will be repeated a few times and the words of the song. Let's take a few moments in prayer with this carol. pray as Christmas approaches that we might be ready to receive him who comes as Immanuel. Might we be as tabernacles, carrying God's presence into the world that is waiting for light and life. Pray for us, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us, Saint Joseph, Father of Jesus. Thank you very much, David. Um, if anybody would like to ask any questions uh, you're welcome to put them into the chat um, and then we can David will attempt to answer them um, and Ursula we all know that you have prepared that question <laughs> that gives people time to think about what they want to ask <laughs> so that um, that first hymn uh, Mary did you know as a mother, um, it's quite a striking thing because even as a mother, you have a baby and you have no idea what that child is going to become or do in their lifetime. But at the same time, um, the last hymn tied in for me because 
there's a there's an opportunity for each of us to become something that we don't know we can become still um so not only as a mother but as an individual so th that was what struck me um you know and and the idea of a tent that we're always in motion we're never stationary um yeah just a comment thank you those are three beautiful comments no no questions in the chat yet well, we'll wait a few moments and maybe they will come. Yeah. Perhaps I can take a moment to um, thank you, everybody, for joining us every week. Um, it's been wonderful to have such a, a, an online presence. Um, we've offered the, this offering has been for free. Um, and if any of you are able to or willing or would like to make a donation to the Jesuit Institute, um, our bank details are on the website. Um, alternatively, I think at the end of the the YouTube, the the it does come up. So we would we always grateful for any offerings that you're able to make. So thank you very very much. A uh, number of things in the chat. Yes, one of them is a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sean says uh, we saw three different translations of the word kataluma. What is the Greek use of the word? So we would need to say that the different English translations do render the sense of katalima. Katalima can be, as we saw, a tent, a tabernacle, a residence, a, a guest room, an inn. None of these are wrong translations. But where do things go wrong? And this I say with fear and trepidation. It is when a word is used twice by an author who I believe clearly wants us to make a link between the two uses of the same word, okay? So it's not wrong from a translation of Greek point of view to translate in verse 2-7 of Luke, katalima, as a uh, in. And it's not wrong in the translation in chapter 22, verse 11, to translate katalima as a guest room. What is wrong is that we don't use the same word, so that in English, we cannot make the connection that is so clear in Greek. That's where the translation falls into a problem. And of course, this is very difficult because it means reading the book over and over and over again so that we can let it resonate in our ears and then translate it with that resonance. That's what we are missing out on. And I must say that I've looked at lots of translations and very few of them allow us to make the connection. So yeah, I think that here is where translation is the constant ongoing attempt to give us a rendering of the original that allows us to make the connections that the, the author would like us to make. And I hope that you all see that in this particular case, it's very revealing, a very, very revealing that the laying of Jesus in a manger food is preparation for what will happen when there is place in the Catalima in chapter 22. The hell says, um, Catalina to me sounds like it sh should be our hearts where Jesus is welcome to dwell and make his dwelling. Thank you, Sohel, indeed. Uh, that's why the prayer said, may we be ready to receive him. Okay, our, our concern is that he does not come again into our communities, into our families, into our lives. And again, there is no place for him. So indeed, I think that this is our prayer in the time of Advent. Are we making place for him? And I'd say even more that that place is really at the center of our beings. Um, play in Cape Town says, virgin or young girl or woman, does it matter? 
Surely it does, otherwise we would be stressing virgin birth, uh, sorry, and Mary remaining a virgin before, during, and after the birth. So indeed, uh, it has come to matter very, very deeply in the development of our understanding who Mary is in the life of Jesus. And so, yes, I, already by the fourth century, we have the formulation uh, before, during, and after, and what that means. I think, though, we must be very careful not to get hung up on physiology and biology. These are theological statements about the word of God incarnate being carried in the tabernacle of God. And Mary, for us, is that Ark of the Covenant. Uh, so, again, it's complex. We don't have time, and I'm not a great theologian in order to go into all of that complexity. But um, as I tried to explain also two weeks ago, uh, the virginity of Mary is signifying certain theological qualities that cannot be reduced to some kind of physiology. Um, I find the comparison between Luke 2 verse 7 and Luke 22 interesting. Could you kindly recap the significance of the echoing of the words wrapped, laid, etc.? What exactly is the reader being drawn to? Okay, so just a little correction. That's not in Luke 22, but in Luke 23. Okay, when Joseph of Arimathea takes the body down, wraps it, and lays it. And again, I think that what's being laid out here in the line of Mary's prophecy, that in her three verbs carried out at the time of Jesus's birth, she is in fact preparing Jesus for burial ah, at the moment of his death. It's, it, she has some sense. And again, this is Mary as written by Luke, Mary the prophetess. She is already prefiguring what will happen to that body at the end of the body's life, died on the cross, taken down, wrapped and laid in the tomb. Now, we have something very similar. We didn't talk about this in our four sessions, but I'm going to mention it now. We have something similar in Matthew chapter 2, the text that we read on Epiphany. We all remember the Magi who come to Jerusalem. Okay, they are led by a star to Jerusalem. Notice, not led straight to Bethlehem. They have to pass through Jerusalem. They have to pass through the encounter with the Jewish people, the encounter with the scriptures. They are not Jews coming from the East Gentiles. And so they come to Jerusalem and hear the citation of Micah, and then they get sent to Bethlehem. Now, we all also remember that they bring gifts and two of the gifts are absolutely expected according to what is already written in the book of Isaiah chapter 60. The kings will come from the nations and they will bring gold and incense, frankincense. Okay, what does gold represent? Well, clearly it represents he is a king. They have asked the king, where is the king? Very provocative. Where's the king? They say to the king. Okay, he would have gone crazy. He's the king. What are they saying? But not important. They bring gold. And they bring frankincense because he's not only a king. He's also a high priest. But you remember the third gift that they bring. The third gift is a shock. It's not mentioned in Isaiah or anywhere else. It's not a gift you give a baby. It's myrrh. And what do you use myrrh for? to prepare a body for burial. And again, there we have that same theme of these infancy narratives are preparing us to recognize the one who dies on the cross, is buried and rises from the dead. Mm -hmm. Notice again, uh, much more than facticity, a factual history that we can then argue with everyone say, this is exactly what happened. The people who are writing these narratives clearly based upon things that they've heard about the history of Jesus, are writing with a very strong focus on Easter. Christmas is already a little Easter. Christmas, 
the small feast is preparing us for the bigger feast. And that's what Mary is doing. That's the link between chapter 2 and chapter 23. And in the Gospel of Matthew, the link between the gifts and what happens at the end of the story when Jesus is taken down and the mere, the mere bearing women come to uh, anoint his body. Um, lots of people say thank you very much for uh, the in-depth series and um, I keep losing my place here. Let me find it quickly. Um, yeah, wishing, you know, thanks for a wonderful series. The, se the show, sessions show the depth and insights we can get from familiar passages. Uh, thank you for an informative workshop. Um, so thanks for everybody for those comments. Um, Colby Chaplaincy, I'm not sure who is at the chaplaincy, says, we had poor internet this evening. Uh, last week, I think there was a question about the vows of a Nazarite. John the Baptist kept these vows. I think the question was, why not Jesus? Could you say something about this, if it's appropriate to fit in? So, yes, we can say something specifically because it, of course, rings out with the readings from the liturgy today. Uh, on the 19th of December, we have the reading of the Annunciation to Zechariah in the temple. And what goes hand in hand with that is the Annunciation to the wife of Manoah from uh, the book of Judges, who is going to give birth to Samson. And she is told that Samson must be a Nazarite. And so what is a Nazarite? Well, if we look at the details of what is described to the wife of Manoah, his hair must not be cut, he must not drink any form of alcohol, and he must keep himself pure. But I think that there is something else going on when we look more in depth at the description of the Nazarite legislation in the book of Numbers. It seems to be, and this is a theory, an exegetical theory, that what the Nazarite represents is a kind of democratization of the priesthood. The Nazarite being a kind of consecrated person who does not come from the priestly lineage, but is in the service of God. And John, yes, ah, clearly the, the, the link is being made with John, but I think that then when we move to Jesus, we all become, and this is God's intention right from the beginning, we all become a kingdom of priests. There is no need now to try and be some kind of specially consecrated person because, as Vatican II teaches us, there is a commonality of priesthood which extends to all of us. And so perhaps the difference between John and then Jesus coming is that Jesus says, well, now each of us in our own particular way is called into that consecration and that kind of sanctity. It's not a question of whether we drink alcohol or not, whether we cut our hair or not, or whether we eat only uh, the permitted foods according to the Old Testament. Now we need to live lives that radiate uh, Jesus' presence in the world, for God is with us in a way that is much more open and without walls. Okay, so we have all become a people of priests. That doesn't mean it's magic. It does mean that we make a consecration to really continue to reflect on who Jesus is, adore him, and walk after him on his way. There's a very cheeky comment from Jill, but I think she uh, might have left already. Um, how are we sure that Jesus is the firstborn son? Thinking about our discussion this morning. <laughs> so, of course, Jill is perfectly correct, but it's a very interesting. Jesus is not the firstborn son. Jesus is the only son. Mary gave birth to her firstborn son. And of course, again, it is echoing the description of Israel in the book of Exodus, chapter 4, verse 22. Okay? But we know that Mary didn't have any other children. 
We know, of course, according to tradition, that she was a virgin before, during, and after. No more children. So what does it mean that he's the firstborn son? Well, it means that we are all called into that, that, that childship. I'm trying to avoid saying son, sons, being sons, because we are all called into being sons and daughters. And there, of course, the epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 2 has that beautiful formulation of Jesus being our brother. So we are all given Mary as a mother. And that, of course, works itself out so beautifully under the cross when Jesus, among his last words, says, ah, here is your son, here is your mother to us as church. So, yes, Jesus is the firstborn son when we take into consideration that he is our older brother and that all of us are children of Mary and therefore she being the mother of God, we are children of God. Of course, when we live faithfully, the vocation of being Alta Christi, other Christs in the world. I think, David, that's a, a good place to stop because we've reached our time. So um, I'd like to just say Merry Christmas to everyone. It's been a great joy these four weeks to learn together. And hopefully there will be other opportunities through the Jesuit Institute to gather together and learn together some more. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, and we wish you all a, a very blessed Christmas. I will have Christmas Day in the Holy Land as I'm going back on Christmas Eve. So that is addressed also to some of those who are with us, who are joining us from the Holy Land. So I look forward to meeting with you, especially Sohail and Dorit, who are here right in front of me and others who I might not see on the screen. God bless you all and Christmas blessings. Thank you.